because he was talking about God. And what he, the point that he wanted to make was that all people are created by God. And to understand your enemy's position is, is, uh, uh, is difficult to do. We don't want to do it. We'd rather, we'd rather be, uh, sometimes, we'd rather be radicalized and, and, and fight them and, and hope they'll go away. Um, Fourteen times in the book of Exodus, it is said that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh and did not let them go out easily. You mean God uh, understood Pharaoh's point of view? What is this? God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Yes, God understood Pharaoh's point of view. Uh, I'm a southerner. I come from Memphis. If you were to tell a southerner to let those people go without a fight, a four-year fight that killed 600,000 men, were they going to let them go easily? They're going to pull the rug out from under their economy? That's their loss, you see. That's their, their, their uh, they think that's a livelihood. They're going to get radicalized about it. But we had a president, fortunately at that moment, who had vision. That's all, we just have to be grateful for that. But, uh, but uh, I think that while we're trying to understand each other, we have to understand our own people who are uh, upset by having what they feel their rights curtailed. And address them, and I would say address them together. And I would just say that, you know, it, it's a complicated uh, issue when you, you look at, you know, people becoming what is determined or, or considered as, as radicalized to when they become uh, violent against others uh, is outside of the, the norms in Islam, is outside of what would the, the, the scholars or the alims uh, would, would be teaching. If you go to any Muslim land or throughout Islamic history, you won't find that the scholars as, as a group support this, but as individuals, sometimes when they do feel marginalized, when they, when they do feel that they have no, no voice and they do feel in, in desperation, then they feel that they must act out. But when they come into truly looking at and using Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings upon him, as truly the model, you know, and then truly as, as, as the guy, and how did he deal in situations and circumstances when he had open enemies, you know, how did he respond to that? And what did he teach for us to respond to? And what does the Quran say when it comes to your enemies? And about the, 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 not only the, the love for them, but to not, especially if you're acting in righteousness, if you're really a, a person striving to be in God's pleasure, that you wouldn't do evil with evil. Because somebody does you wrong, you don't do wrong back. You continue to do good. You believe that God truly is the total know of everything and the control of everything and you trust. And when we have pockets you know, of, of young people uh, energized and, and sometimes idealistic, then you, you see them act outside of uh, what the norms are. And this is why the majority of Muslims throughout the world uh, oppose and, and, and abhor a lot of these things that are done in the name of Allah, in the name of, of Islam, in the name of the religion. Uh, because again, this is not the way of, of Prophet Muhammad. So, so when you look at what he did, even in the uh, before he left Mecca and went to Medina, and the Muslims were being persecuted by the, the, the Arabs, on two occasions he sent them to a Christian land. So we know that, that there was a relationship with the Prophet and him understanding that these were good people and that the Muslims would be able to go there and to be able to practice their faith and not to be oppressed or not to be ostracized. And even when he himself uh, again, was attacked literally, he always showed and, and taught us patience and perseverance. And so when one really acts upon what the prophet did, and not just hear it and, 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 and uh, quote it, but live it, then we won't see these behaviors. And, and, and it is our responsibility to continue to get this message to our young people uh, as we see in this phenomenon across the, the world, uh, particularly among our youth who sometimes, again, are very idealistic. Uh, and think that if they just act out on something that there's going to be change and not understand change does not happen that way. And if you look at 
history, historically, things have to happen in cooperation and collaboration with all faiths and all communities. Because even, and I'll conclu conclude with this, even when, when the prophet came back into Mecca and conquered Mecca, he did not come in and say, I'm going to kill everybody who's not a Muslim, who, all of the mushriks and all of those who attack my people and all of those who oppress us all of this time. He came in with, with, with open and, and mercy. And, and, and this is, is, is always, I mean, the, the model we look at this and see, how did he respond? How did he act? And when we look and see the historical relationships that he established after this with some of the Christian communities and the protections that he placed upon them, uh, it was something that, that was maintained under the different caliphs. And again, one last thing is in 1992, one of the most beautiful things that, that I remember was that the Jewish community in Turkey and in Morocco celebrated 500 years of living amongst Muslims. You know, uh, and, and, I mean, and, and again, when Muslims really act upon and, 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 and participate in this faith in a living way, there is no way we would not have an open and a working relationship with those of other faiths, traditions. Thank you. First and foremost, I really want to commend uh, the mosque for having a dialogue and discourse like this. Uh, it's, uh, you, you're truly doing God's work by doing this. Uh, my wife and I both work with the uh, Sheriff's Clergy Council as well as in our capacities with out, outreach with various government agencies. And one of the things that, that comes up and we run into uh, too frequently is that the communities that are being affected, whether it be Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, the moderates are not standing up against the radicalism that has to be there. Um, could you address that? I think that the people who see two sides of an issue are not eager to run out to the battle line. You notice that nearly all leaders of armies have to teach hatred of the enemy, or they won't go out and kill. And that's, I mean, that's got to stop in my opinion, but it hasn't yet. Uh, I, I think, however, that uh, moderates should stand up. That is to say, people who believe as we apparently do in this room should stand up, uh, but it's not easy to do so, um, but we should. I just would say that I think that there is an increased um, effort throughout the United States that I'm aware of from most uh, large Islamic uh, centers and mosques and organizations to really be engaged in uh, uh, interfaith activities um, more than prior to the last 15 years. And, uh, and I think in, in the Muslim community is, is, is really concerned about our youth and, and I think that there's going to be more effort. To, to make sure that our young people, you know, really see the difference between whatever's going on politically and the political motivation behind a lot of these things and how they really aren't connected to faith at all and how to have a faithful life. And, and that effort must be increased. Uh, I think there's, there's more of a need to make sure that, that again, that there's uh, ways to reach not only the youth that come to the mosque, but the youth that don't come that there must be a way to, to, to get the word out to them so they can trust the older persons to, to talk to so that they can realize that what they're facing and what they see in this world is not new. I mean, if you look back from World War I and a lot of the, the things that people thought was going to happen and how their lives were going to be devastated or destroyed, but it didn't happen. And we, and we see the continued progression that, it, that has taken place. And so they must hear that message and hear that story uh, and know that there is an alternative uh, and, and, and how to have feelings, but not how to act out on those feelings. And, and again, that's where the work really comes in to, to more, not only the Islamic leadership, but actually the, 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 the members, the families, must make sure that they get these messages to the young people. If I could uh, make one addition, uh, one additional comment, there is an organization uh, called the One Voice Movement, and they're doing a lot of very good work in Israel right now. I don't know if any of you have heard of the One Voice Movement. I'm trying to remember the name of the founder, uh, but uh, he's a, uh, a Jew from South America, if I remember correctly. But uh, they are attempting to get the moderate majority in Israel to speak up, the people who are interested in a two-state solution, uh, and to, to essentially be as vociferous or more vociferous than the so-called radicals of, of, you know, of that region who are, who are not interested in, uh, in peace.
I, so I just wanted to mention that. So you might want to take a look at One Voice Movement, Google it. I think they're a very good organization, in my opinion. Daniel. Yeah, Daniel, I don't remember his last name. Uh, yeah, if, if I felt comfortable grabbing my cell phone, I would. But. Yeah. Thank you all for being here and putting this on. Um, quite impressed with this. I do have one question regarding um, the vi each of your major religions stance with regards to um, the kingdom of earth versus the kingdom of heaven and the ability to suffer through living is a reward for, or I'm sorry, for a reward in the kingdom of heaven. Um, what barriers do you see to interfaith dialogue um, or how does that ramp up radicalism and factionalism if that kind of suffering is allowed to be tolerated for a reward in the afterlife? Does that make sense? It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a complex question. I think, I think I know where you're coming from. This is one of my former star students, by the way, and a good friend of mine. But uh, it, it, may, I, may I maybe encapsulate your question or, 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 or distill a little bit? If I understand what, what uh, Jared's saying, um, in, in many particular uh, traditions, specifically within Christianity, I understand, and I mean I can't speak to Islam specifically, but within Christianity, uh, having suffered through persecution under the Romans, for instance, and uh, being convinced that there would be a greater reward uh, for suffering in this world, that the reward would be in the next world, suffering through intolerable circumstances. Um, and I suppose on some level that is going on in certain Muslim communities around the world, perhaps the ones that are radicalizing, if I understand what you're saying, that uh, suffering under intolerable circumstances and that it winds up breeding the, the radicalism so as to uh, allow the individuals to, to search for a better future in heaven rather than here on earth. I think there's a difference between the kind of um, suffering that we saw lifted up in the personality of um, Pope John XXIII. I'm not a Catholic, but I was impressed with how he uh, was um, able to um, understand his suffering as a gift of God. And I find that different from those who are willing to commit suicide and kill a lot of others. A vast difference between the two. And I think that those young people who want to do that need to hear the kinds of discussions we're having today, rather than um, incre the increasing anger that they have at the interference of the West into their lives and into their culture. I'll offer this, and it, it may be answering a different question that was, than that which was asked, but rabbis are good at doing that. <laughs> so, um, one of the greatest lines of connection that I've seen among religions have to do with those who are suffering within those religions. In other words, I've often found that uh, there is something that Orthodox Jewish women who live in very Orthodox circumstances have in common with Muslim women who are in very traditional circumstances also. And there are lines of connection that they often can express with one another about what it's like to be a woman in that society. I've seen the same thing with gays and lesbians in Judaism and in Christianity and in Islam. That that because they're often marginalized, they find these points of connection within that. Um, and so while it's a little bit different from the question that you're asking, oftentimes those who experience a certain amount of suffering or, or oppression within their circumstance, there's interestingly a bridge between religions that they find and conversation and communication that others who are perhaps in the majority voice within the religion, don't share. So. I just, in brief, would, would just like to say that, you know, in the Islamic tradition, you know, when you talk about suffering, uh, again, we use, the Quran is full of accounts of the prophets and the messengers who came before, and of their struggles that they went through before, and sometimes of the 
dire circumstances that they lived through and how they persevered and trusted in God. And so one is taught how to trust in God. And, and some of the suffering that we see in, in the different parts of the world is not because of some natural reason. I mean, it's just because of some political stuff that's going on and not necessarily had nothing to do with the West. And we haven't seen a lot of these revolts and this revulsion uh, occur uh, under some of these different, you know, uh, regimes and, 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 and occurrences. One of the things, I think the phenomenons that's going on, when you look at the, the Middle Eastern part of the world and much of the world, there is so many young people uh, who have felt that they are detached from opportunity to come from out of some dire situations or circumstances that is pretty much relevant to our particular time. But when you look back at time, I mean, there are better when people who live, you know, in circumstances and situations uh, that we could consider are dire, but they don't look at it in, in that way. So it's a matter of values and how people are, are, are given these values. Uh, and, and because we believe that somebody having something, not having something, all that's from God. You know, I mean, that, that's, you know, so that they're, they're, there's nobody to blame for that. And it, and it is that you continue to use the skills, the gifts to see can you come out of this, because there's been so many situations. The person who was born from a family that didn't have anything had become with a whole lot. I mean, and this is a consistent reality among people. So people of faith try to inculcate that uh, in young people, and, and again, to, to try to channel, uh, again, the traditions of the other faith communities that they too have people. Because again, people, whether in any society, in any country, in any religion, you have people who are poor, you have people who are wealthy, you have people who are marginalized in every community. So there is that relationship, again, of being able to cooperate collectively to come uh, through that experience. I just want to end uh, the program here and with uh, one, there's going to be a surprise, and we love surprises. Uh, uh, before, um, uh, uh, before we move on, I'd like to say one thing, because th this is a, could be a very theologically inspirational discussion, but through the Q&A, we got into the flat tire. You know, you can, have a, you can have a Rolls Royce or the best vehicle in your mind, but if you have a flat tire, it doesn't move. And when someone looks at the glass half empty, they think about the flat tire, not this $400,000 vehicle. We have a faith, faiths that comes from the supreme being that is beautiful to all of us. And these radicals are the flat tires. That's all they are. And we cannot let them monopolize the dialogue. Because whenever I get into these dialogues, very beautiful, and all of a sudden, this flat tire pops up, you know? So I don't want to be like news, the news televisions, where it's, we always talk about bad news, we talk about the good news, you know? So I want to move on, and uh, I met a very inspirational lady, um, uh, Elaine Coleman, who's a managing director of her company, and uh, I asked her to say a few words because there's some uh, young woman in, she could uh, inspire some of the young people. So uh, uh, Samia uh, Banu, who is one of the co-founders of Muslim Youth Symposium here in America, she's a happiness coach. Mm -hmm. She has a lot to offer to the community and society in general. She's very, very much part of our interfaith work. And Samia, could you introduce uh, Ms. Coleman? So glad to see everyone here. It's been an awesome afternoon. Speak loud. <laughs> um, so Elaine Coleman brings over 15 years of research and product design to her role leading Bovitz Media in emerging technologies. Prior to Bovitz, Coleman co-founded Resolve Market Research, a global consultancy focused on the transformative impact of digital media and technology. There she led seminal research on the impact of tablet adoption across industries. A category expert, Coleman previously served as managing director, mobile tech interpret. Prior, she directed research for entertainment clients at market cost and led product design research for the Java division of Sun Microsystems. Elaine holds a PhD in Cognitive Science from the University of Toronto and received a McDonnell Postdoctoral Fellowship at UC Berkeley. Um, I 
really think that you just needed a woman on this panel. <laughs> so I've been sitting here and wondering why am I here, which I think is really the existential question that we're all asking. I am a cognitive scientist, which means I was trained in thinking about how you think and how you make sense of the world, how you make sense of images and scripts and how you put it together. And, and uh, through that, I became a prof I was a professor and thought I was going into academia, but then life Life is what happens when you plan other things. And I uh, ended up in business uh, through tink, think tanks and then in business. And I think, so I've been trying to think about how I'm going to tie into this. Um, I believe in human beings. Uh, maybe I'm a romanticist. I am Jewish by faith, and I come from a line of rabbis. And many of them are turning over in their graves, as my mother says. <laughs> um, but. Uh, I guess I don't really believe that you have to be religious in order to really believe in people and doing the right thing. Um, and although I think that sometimes I think raccoons are evolving a lot faster than human beings, which makes me sad, I do, I do think that the premise of where we begin to question is really when we think about causality. I think when you see an event in the world uh, for the first time, you wonder why. And I think that wondering and that search for causality is part of our DNA. And then we need reasons. And sometimes we find them in science, and sometimes we find them in religion. Um, and uh, we search for those meanings to make sense. Um, I think we also, unfortunately, are designed to be very fearful of difference. And uh, that's unfortunate. It's probably, from an evolutionary perspective, important. I think it's important to know when we categorize things because we have to get out of the way. If an animal is approaching us, it's important to know whether it's a, an animal that's going to attack you or it's an animal that wants to be your friend. So I think all of these things are really at the basis of who we are as human beings. Um, and as cognitive scientists, we try to understand those things. Uh, but many scientists are very religious, and um, they reconcile that, and it's important in their lives. I think one comment I would just make is um, you all practice in your own places. People go to those places because they're comfortable, because they know they're going to go through rituals that are the same, that they're going to meet people of like-mindedness. Um, and it, I don't know if conversations happen in those comfortable places where they're all the same about other places. And so I think sometimes religion makes it difficult, much more difficult for people to understand and embrace others. Um, I think we all come into the world really happy, and it's only through life that we become less happy. <laughs> um, and so uh, I hope that through uses of technology and openness, uh, maybe there's a possibility for everybody to really advance in the way that you speak. I think I came here to talk about leadership, and I really wanted to talk about the women in the, to, to the women in the room. I hope that you embrace technology. Emerging technology is happening in our society so fast, and take advantage of it. How many of you own smartphones? Just raise your hand. So. That's amazing, because you have access to so much information that so many people don't. And uh, I really believe that uh, women need to step up. And if you read Sheryl Sandberg's book, you really need to lean in. You have to have a voice, because if you don't participate, then we won't have the true diversity that we need in order to make a difference. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's a great honor to have Mr. Sanders here. So we want to give him a token of appreciation and an award for his life of service to, the, to his faith and the faith community and humanity at large. So I'd like to um, uh, present, uh, present him an award. Uh, Bibi, can you come up here as well? Uh, if you go to the... To that, to the uh, so I, like, I will read what uh, it said in Arman, if you can. Uh, uh, the Muslim Youth Symposium in America, MESA, and SOS Society Offering Solutions 
appreciate and, and honors Dr. James A. Sanders, PhD, world-renowned res researcher, author, and scholar of biblical studies for dedicating your life to the teachings of biblical studies in the fields of Hebrew Bible and the New Testament studies, author of 29 books and over 300 scholarly articles with an emphasis, emphasis of interfaith dialogue within the Abrahamic faiths. Thank you very much. Uh, Armand, can you take this to Professor? Professor, will you be seated? Uh, we'll present it to Professor Beebe. Stand next to Professor. Uh, uh, we say Bibi because it's uh, a noble way of elderly lady. Uh, could you show it uh, for the camera, Professor? Yes. <laughs> and this should. I, I'm surprised. I knew nothing about this. It should be shared with the rabbi and the imam. I'm, I, I mean, I, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Shukran Katia. You're, you're, you're very welcome. I'd like to end here, and uh, uh, before I end, we obviously have to say thank you. First, I'd like to thank uh, the Institute for Religious to Tolerance, Peace, and Justice. Uh, doctor, thank you very much for sponsoring the event. Uh, I'd like to thank um, the co-sponsors, uh, obviously the King Fahad Mosque, the Muslim Youth Symposium of America, the Muslim Students Association of Culver City High School, thank you very much, and um, uh, Society Offering Solutions. Uh, Society Offering Solutions, SOS, I just founded recently. We have one initiative to begin with called the STOP Initiative. STOP stands for Society to Offer Prosperity and Peace. I have many years doing conflict re resolution here in South Central in the gang environment. Uh, trying to convince young men to put down the guns. So STOP now encourages global governments around the world to set up peace departments. <laughs> that each department, each government must have a department of peace. Whether they have defense or not, we don't get into that issue. But the fact is, as human beings, as people who recognize that we all are going to move to the next world and answer to our creator, that uh, if we have a peace department, with a budget, maybe we can save one life in this earth, which is, rec which is mentioned in the Torah and the Quran. If you save one life, it's as if you save the whole human race. So uh, hopefully, Professor, you can endorse that uh, initiative. Uh, the uh, uh, second group of people I'd like to always thank is the host committee. Without their help, we wouldn't be here. Uh, Nishat Ahmed, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Abdu, thank you very much. Arman, thank you. Uh, Cyrus, thank you very much. Uh, doctor, again, thank you. Habib, Dr. Habib. Uh, Mina, who's in charge of the food back there. And um, uh, Dr. Khalil, Al Khalil, who without him, this place wouldn't exist. Uh, Mike Khattab, um, Ayub, Mr. Mayat, thank you very much. Um, uh, Samia, Samia Ban, thank you very much. And um, uh, Suhaib Naeem, thank you.